If you wouldn't mind turning, please, to Exodus chapter 40 this morning. Exodus chapter 40, the last chapter in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 40 and verse 33. And we're going to just read down to the end of the chapter, verse 38. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gates. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all, all their journeys. And so, Father, we just, we just want, Lord, to stay ourselves this morning in your presence and just acknowledge, Father, in 2024, in the midst of of all that is going on around us, that, Lord, you are sovereign and that, Lord, you sit upon the throne. And though man would plot and scheme and plan, Lord, we're told in Psalm 2 that the Lord shall have them in derision, that, Lord, you shall mock them. Then, Lord, you shall vex them in thy sore displeasure. We thank you this morning, Lord, that my Lord, we can find ourselves in the house of God this morning in the kingdom of our beloved Saviour. And we ask now, Lord, as you promised, you said, my sheep hear my voice. Lord, we would ask this morning that we would hear thy voice. Give us ears this morning to hear what the Spirit saith to the church. I ask for grace now, Lord, upon my own life, upon the word that will be proclaimed, upon our hearing. Father, be glorified. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. I've titled this morning's sermon, It's Time to Move. It's time. It's time to move. If I were to ask you this morning to tell me what the single greatest glory was attending the children of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness. I wonder what answer you would give. Would it be the miraculous wonders, fresh manna by morning, the rock which was clave in two? Would it be the glory of the gold which adorned the holy furniture? in the tent of the congregation? Would it be the precious stones which decorated Aaron's breastplate and the two that rested upon his shoulders? I've no doubt that each and every one of these glories were wonders to behold, yet the glory that I have in mind exceeds the splendor of each of these as heaven exceeds the glory of the earth. You say to me, Brother Paul, can you tell me in your opinion, although I'd argue with that, it's not my opinion, the single greatest glory that for 40 years attended the children of Israel, can you tell me please, as they wandered in the wilderness? Without question I would answer, it was the pillar of cloud which led them by day 
and the pillar of fire that led them by night. The single greatest glory that attended the children of Israel in their wandering journeys was the very presence of God in their midst, leading them in the way that they should go. Do you remember the words of Moses on account of the sins of the people? God said that he would no longer go up in their midst, lest he consume them. But instead he said he'd send an angel. Do you remember Moses' response? He said in Exodus 33 and verse 15, If thy presence go not with me, carry us up, not hence, or carry us not up, hence. If your presence go not with me, Lord, then don't carry me up because I don't want to go. An angel would not suffice. And I know for many within the evangelical church today, they would be quite content with such a proposition. But can the glory of an angel compare with the glory of the God who brought them into existence? Absolutely not. And thus Moses pleads his cause. In verses 15 and 16 of Exodus 33, he says, If thy presence go not with me, carry us up not hence, or carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou, in that thou goest, with us. So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Let that sink in. Wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Ah, these were the words of Elijah in the contest at Mount Carmel. The contest between the gods of Baal, or the Baal, and Yahweh. Let the God which answereth by fire be the true God, God in the midst of his people. Show thyself mighty lords, God came down. Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. The defining and distinguishing hallmark that set Israel apart from their surrounding nations was that their God dwelt with them in their midst. That couldn't be said of any other nation could not be said, but of that nation for 40 years while they wandered in the wilderness, the nations recognized their God dwells with them. Their God is in their very midst, tangibly, visibly, and physically. We're told in Exodus 13 and verses 21 and 22 that the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them, to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And Moses said to God that if your presence go not with me, carry, carry us not up hence. Can you picture it this morning? The awesome wonder. Imagine being a Bedouin tribesman camped in the Sinai Peninsula 
And from a distance you can see a sea of people as far as the eye can see. Upwards of some two million people pitched in uniformed formation around a large structure, the tabernacle. Yet it's not the multitudes, it's not the masses that grips your attention. So much as the column of cloud coming down from heaven upon that holy structure, the tabernacle. And as the night draws in and the sun recedes from sight, that mighty column of cloud descending turns into a column of burning fire. Oh, could you picture it? It could be sea lighting the night sky. What's that fire? That's God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob dwelling in the midst of his people. There God dwells with them. These were days of glory. God manifest amongst his people. Is this not heaven on earth? What's heaven but being in the presence of God? I've said it before that I'm not so interested in the streets of gold as I am in meeting the one who's there. Forever we shall be with the Lord. John beheld this holy city in Revelation chapter 21. Coming down out of heaven, the new Jerusalem, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And he heard a great voice, Revelation 21, verse 2 and 3, saying, coming out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. You see, this isn't an isolated incident. God has always dwelt in the midst of his people. He dwells now in us. And one day, we're told that the tabernacle of God forever shall be with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's heaven, friends. To be forever with the Lord. And so here in Exodus chapter 40, we read how when Moses had concluded the rearing up of the court around the tabernacle, and the altar, and he'd set up the hanging of the court gate, we're told, so Moses finished the work, that which had been given him. By God, the blueprint for the tabernacle, the altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, the menorah, the lava, the brazen altar, the tent surrounding. We're told that when he'd finished the work, then in verse 34, God descended. The cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That which marked the completion of the tabernacle in the days of Moses also marked the completion of the temple some 500 years later in the days of Solomon. This isn't a coincidence. The glory of God came down such as those that were ministering were no longer able to enter the holiness of God, Kodesh. That thrice holy God of Isaiah chapter 6, as the seraphim with six wings and two of them, they did cover their face because they could not look on the majesty and the sublime holiness of a God, of God's. 
And with two of the wings, they covered their feet, unworthy to be in his presence. And with two, they did fly, and they echoed back and forth in sync. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. We're told at the dedication of the temple in Solomon's day, before this point, it was bricks and gold and the craftsmanship of man's hand, but then God came and the people were no longer able to enter. We're reading in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 through to 3. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven. The fire came down from heaven like that on Mount Carmel, and consume the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they did that which was all they could do. They did that which was fitting for such a circumstance. They bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped. And friends, when God draws near to his people, there's no other response. We're not talking light talk anymore. We bow in his presence. We prostrate ourselves in the presence of a holy majesty. And we worship with our faces to the ground. And they praise the Lord, saying, for he is good." For his mercy endureth forever. If I were to ask you this morning to describe the fundamental difference between the temple in Solomon's day and the tabernacle in Moses's, I wonder what answer you would give. Perhaps you'd say, well, Brother Paul, the temple was bigger than the tabernacle. And I'd say you're not wrong, that's correct. The temple was indeed far larger than the tabernacle of Moses. In fact, it was exactly twice its length and twice its width, exactly three times its height. God's a mathematician. Yet that's not the difference that I have in mind. Well, you say, if it's not size, then it must be splendor. Not only was the temple bigger, the temple was more beautiful. And they say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I must agree. The materials and the craftsmanship employed in the building of the temple was of far greater superiority than that which was employed in the construction of the tabernacle. I grant you that. But still I say, this isn't the answer that I have in mind. You say, well, if it's not size and it's not splendor, what is it? What is the difference, the fundamental difference that separates the temple from the tabernacle? And I'll give you a clue. It has to do with location. Where was the temple located? Without hesitation, everyone would say, Jerusalem. But if I was to ask you, well, where was the tabernacle situated? Well, that depends on what day. It depends on what month. It depends on what year. 
Because you see, whereas the temple was a fixed structure, the tabernacle was not. Its whole design structure was such that it was made to be transportable. It was a tent. It was a tent. The temple was made of bricks and mortar, a fixed structure. It was made to be transportable. The curtains and pegs, the cords and pillars, the boards and the bars, the sockets and the coverings, along with the sacred furniture within it, at a moment's notice, without warning, the whole thing could be dismantled and relocated somewhere else. In fact, God gives the very uh, method, the strategy, instructions, precise instructions as to how this was to be done. You want to go and touch the ark and take it out? I don't. The priests alone would go into the tab tab tabernacle and they would cover it first. And then the Levites would come in. Various tribes were apportioned different parts of dismantling the tabernacle of God. And they would put the staves through the hoops and they would carry it on their shoulders. And for 40 years in the wilderness of Sinai, it was exactly on this wise until the children of Israel came to rest in Canaan. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tents of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up in Exodus 40 and verse 36 from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. Can you imagine it? camped around the tabernacle, uniformed, uniformed. I can't think of the word. They were there around the tabernacle camped and suddenly the cloud, the glory of God coming down from heaven would lift up from above the tabernacle. And you as an Israelite, when you saw that, it signaled one thing, that it was time to move. It was time to move. I'm wondering if you know where I'm going with this this morning, those with ears, to hear. He that led his people out of Egypt, led them also into Canaan. And for 40 long years, he led them in the wilderness. In Exodus 15 and verse 13, Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The psalmist writes in Psalm 107 and verse 7, he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 5. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxen old upon you and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. God led his people in the wilderness. And I ask you this morning, in this dispensation of grace, has anything changed? 
Ah, we might not lead us as a pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night, but one thing sure, friends, he still leads his people. He still leads his people. The visible column of cloud might no longer be there, but that does not mean that he no longer leads. He does. God is still present in the midst in the midst, in the midst of his people. He that hath an ear, Jesus says to the churches in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 6, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. God speaks, friends, to his people. He leads us, he guides us, and he says this morning, let him that hath an ear hear. Let us hear, recognize the voice of God above that of the voice of man and say, God, I hear you speaking. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. John 10, John 10, 27. He goes on to say in chapter 16 of John's gospel, verses 13 and 14, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. Tell me this morning, those of you who've been born of the Spirit of God, those who hear his voice, tell me, what has God been saying to you of late? If you had time this morning and we could sit together and talk, I tell you, of the things that God speaks to my heart, the things he sees in my life that he lets me know about. Oh, he speaks. He speaks. He speaks as I'm sat in my seat in the congregation. He speaks to me at times as I'm preaching a sermon. He speaks in the morning watch when I awake and I wait upon him. God speaks to his people. He leads by his spirit. He ministers through his word. Let him that hath an ear to hear, hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. What has God been saying to you of late? How has the good shepherd been leading you? For are we not in a wilderness, pilgrims wandering through? on our way to glory. And when the cloud was taken up in Exodus 40 and verse 36 from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journey. And that's the heart of the matter this morning. New Testament reality seen in Old Testament type. Can you say the same this morning in earnest? Can you? When the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journey. I wonder if some of you found in the place of procrastination, delay, <laughs> when the cloud has been taken up. God waits. He waits. He waits for your obedience. 
Do not be deceived when the presence of God has gone up from in your midst. That's the indication to get ready. And where he should lead us, well, there we shall go. And I wouldn't want to be a straggler in the wilderness when the cloud of glory has been lifted up. I don't want to get all sentimental about it and say, well, I kind of like this location. If God's signaling we go, then we go. We move at his command. We string down our tents. We dismantle the tabernacle. And we look for where that cloud should go next. And where God leads his people, there the children of Israel were to be found following. And I submit, friends, nothing has changed. That where God leads his people, where he leads you, where he leads me, we're not to be stragglers. We're not to delay. When the presence of God has gone up from in your midst, it will never be the same while you tarry. It won't. What made it so beautiful was not the decorated coverings on the tabernacle. What made it beautiful wasn't the religious aroma as the priests were camped around it in the inner circle, no. What made it glorious was the presence of God. And brothers and sisters, I can think of no greater thing in my life than to experience God, to know his nearness in my life. I often speak about this. It's the nearness of God to know that he is nigh unto me, not only in theology, but in experience. You see, the Lord makes known his presence. It's called joy. It's called peace. And when you're in right relationship with God in the center of his will, then your life will be characterized, no matter the storm around you, it will be characterized by shalom. The Lord is near. And when you're outside of his will, you can go to Jamaica and sit on the beach and you'll be as miserable there as anywhere else on planet Earth because the Lord's not there. The cloud is lifted up and he waits for your obedience and he waits for mine. If there's one thing I've come to learn, it's this, that there is no substitute for reality reality with God. Oh, is the Lord speaking to someone's heart this morning? And he's saying to you, it's time to move. Come on now, pick up pace. The cloud has lifted up for some months now and you're still tarrying. What are you waiting for? If any man come after me, in Matthew 16 and verse 24, Jesus said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There's always a cross. When God calls, when the cloud is lifted up, let him deny himself, herself, take up his cross and follow me. If you turn to Numbers chapter 9, I won't be too long this morning in Numbers chapter 9. In Numbers chapter 9, we are given more detail, more detail on that which we've already just read in Exodus chapter 40. We're given finer details. In Numbers chapter 9 and verse 15. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. And that even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. 
So it was always, the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that, the children of Israel journeyed. And in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed. And at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched. They pitched. I want to draw to your attention verses 17 and 18. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed, journeyed. I find that the Christian walk is a journey. We're not stationary for too long because we're pilgrims passing through on our way to Canaan, the promised land, heaven, Zion, the heavenly man, Zion. God's always leading and journeying. Sometimes we're resting for a season, granted, but then the Lord draws near and says, come on now, it's time to move. We're pilgrims. We're pilgrims. And in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched. Not only did the Israelites journey at the commandment of the Lord, in the place where the cloud remained, there they also pitched, pitched their tents. Can I say that it's not enough merely to journey with the Lord? You see, there's a lot of casual, casual wanderers. Prepare to follow the Lord so long as it does not require that dreaded word, commitment. But I've come to find you can't follow the Lord without commitment. The very basics when the Lord doth call us involves commitment. It's not enough to merely journey with the Lord. We're told at the place where the cloud remained, there they pitched their tents. And we too at his command must journey and at his command must pitch our tents. And this point speaks to many a heart because the great lack not only in the world today but also in the church is that of commitment. Commitment is at an all-time low in the world and also in the church. No one wants to commit to anything. We'll cohabit and live in fornication because, well, I don't want to commit in marriage because we know what that means. It, it holds us to something. It binds us to something. Yeah, it's called a covenant where vows are exchanged, promises made. And I find that we're happy to just wander around as long as we don't have to commit to anything. But friends, God would have us commit to something. He would. If we were to go on with God in usefulness, there has to be a measure of commitment. As a pastor, I can't just come when I want and when I think, you know what, I'll give this Sunday a miss. That would be nonsense and you'd rightly be enraged and you'd say, what kind of pastor is this? Because it involves commitment. To follow the Lord involves commitment. Journeying with him. At his command we move, but also at his command we pitch. We pitch. Pitching speaks of commitment, taking the pegs and driving them into the ground. The command to follow friends is always the command to 
commit. And that's why I'm so against this easy believism stuff today. Put your hand up. Anyone want to receive Jesus? Well, I think I'll have him. But we don't want the commitment. We want to go to heaven, but we don't want to live for him on earth. Friends, that's a mockery. That's a farce. Decide for Christ, yes, but understand what to follow him really means. Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And he saith unto him, unto them, these two words, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And we're told that straight away, immediately, they left their nets and followed him. There was some commitment. They said goodbye to their livelihoods, goodbye to their ship. Because there's one greater calling me to follow him. His name is Jesus Christ. And I can't stay no longer with those things he's calling me to leave. That's commitment. And they followed him. But going on from thence, this is from Mark, Mark, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. Going on from thence, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And look, he called them. And what? Immediately. Without procrastinating, without delay. Without delay, they left the ship, they left their father, they left their nets, doesn't tell us that, but they did, and they followed him. When he called, they were in the middle of mending their nets, nets, but they understood that the call of God was far greater than earthly pursuits, and so they left all and followed him. When the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. Tell me this morning, are you procrastinating? Are you found in the place of delay? You say, well, if God would speak to me, but friends, he already has. But if God would let me know, doubly sure, but he already has. How many more fleeces do you want to put before God? My sheep hear my voice and the problem isn't the voice of God. The problem is our hearts. We don't like perhaps what we're hearing. It's going to involve sacrifice. It's going to involve cost. It's going to involve us saying goodbye to the temporal things. But if he's calling, then what are we to do? To stay behind? To stay behind? You wouldn't last long in a wilderness. If God wasn't leading, what are you supposed to do? The rest of the Israelites, some two million, go on and you say, well, I'm just going to stay here, I think. I'll give you a day and you won't be living any longer because when that sun comes up at night, where are you getting your food from? Where are you getting your water from? Where are you even going? You've got no map in the middle of a desert. See, God designed it that his people weren't to live apart from him. He was to lead them in their very midst. And the Christian, despite what we think, is not left to his own devices to just sort of hopscotch it through. We need the Lord in every area of our life because without him, we head into destruction. Without him, we make a complete mess of things. We need him. We need him. But I want to submit, because that's not all the passage says. Look with me, please, at verse 37 of Exodus chapter 40. Keep your place in Numbers chapter 9. We won't be too long. Exodus chapter 40. Verse 36. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. And then we come to this word, but, in verse 37. But, 
If the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. I want to submit that obedience is not always seen in forward movement. Sometimes obedience is seen in the waiting, just as much as it is in the forward movement. You see, they needed just as much obedience to move when God said move as they did to wait when God said wait. Both involve obedience. We can either be procrastinators, delaying when God says move, or the other extreme is that we can be presumptuous, moving when God has said not to, taking in hand to do when God has said to be still and to wait, and I will perform. God was teaching them obedience in their movement, obedience also in their waiting. In Numbers 9 and verse 18, at the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched. Listen to this. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tent. To delay in the face of a clear command to move from God is sin. It's rebellion. It is, but equally. To move prematurely in the absence of a command to do so is also sin. And I find that we can struggle at both extremes. We call this the sin of presumption and the church is racked full of it because no one has a relationship with God. We just run off air. What we think, what we feel, what looks good, what sounds, we'll just do it. And because of that, we find that mess follows us everywhere because we won't wait on God. We want it now. And we're not prepared to wait on God. May God deliver us from being a self-willed people. I say again, can you imagine Israel dwelt in the middle of a wilderness without the pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night? They were done for. Where were they going to go? Can you imagine one of those Israelites just thinking, well, I just think I'm going to move on somewhere else. We'll go for it. But just the same as the one who doesn't follow when the Lord leads and thinks I'll stay behind, the same thing is true of the one that wanders without the Lord's leading. They're both in the same pit, where they're going to get water from, where they're going to get food from. They couldn't have thought it possible to move without God. But our problem is, is that sometimes we don't quite see it that way. And we think, well, do you know what? We'll be all right. Got a good bank account, actually. It's due to get paid at the end of the month. That should plug the gap. Got Google if I run into any problems. Few good friends around me. Friends, we can't afford to move without the Lord. And as the days unfold and the events of the end times come upon us, I tell you, friends, we won't have that liberty to just move out when we feel like it. We're going to need to wait on God. COVID revealed that. We had to wait on God for his leading. We were faced in a situation in a place where we'd not been before. Did God lead? God led to those who were seeking him and had ears to hear. And I love this in verse 19, because you see, even when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle, we don't like that bit too much, still they rested and did not move. 
When the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days. Oh, some of you perhaps are in that camp this morning. The cloud's been tarrying for many days. It's been tarrying long. Lord, are you going to speak? Lord, are you going to give me some indication? Should I go left? Should I go right? Should I take that job? Shouldn't I? Should I marry this person? Shouldn't I? Lord, you're not giving me any direction here. And that's because he wants you to wait. He knows the need, but he's saying, wait. When the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge, the command of God, and they did not journey. And so it was when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandments of the Lord, they abode in their tents, and according to the commandments of the Lord, they journeyed. So see how this works. Were you to sit an Israelite down and say, well, is there some regularity to this pattern? I mean, does the cloud move every week or every year or every... They would have said there's no, there's no regularity. Sometimes it's a few days. Sometimes it's many days. Sometimes it's months. Sometimes it's a year. We can't box God in. He just leads us after his own will, in his own time, in his own way. And all that we know is that we don't move until the cloud moves, till the cloud comes up from above the tabernacle. And so it was in verse 21, when the cloud abode from even until morning, so sometimes it just abode on the tent, it remained on the tent of the tabernacle just for 24 hours, one evening and one morning, and then it moved. Then they journeyed, whether it was by day or by night. So sometimes they'd be sleeping in their beds two o'clock in the morning. The trumpet would sound because the fire is lifted up from off the tabernacle. Two o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, string the tabernacle down, pack your tents up, we're moving. God has spoken, God is leading. Whether it was by day or by night that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. Whether it was two days or a month or, oh no, a year. I've got to wait a year. A year is a long time. Sometimes they were camped for a year. But the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle remaining thereon. The children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. As I close this morning, I want to ask you the question. Is this merely a historical account? Is this mere history of the Israelites that has no bearing on us in 2024? Or perhaps is God trying to still say something to us through their example we can learn? Same God, different method may be, but same God leading his people, same principle. When God says move, you move. When he says wait, you wait. From Genesis through to Revelation, it's been that way. And maybe you have a problem of forward movement this morning. And God is convicting you and he's saying, son, daughter, enough now. Move at my commands. What are you going to do? God's speaking. I tell you, friends, I've said it so many times. Some of us just wander around in circles. And we don't learn the lesson. That to obey God is always the best thing you could ever do. It always goes well with your soul when you obey the Lord. The problems in my life have not come through me obeying God. Every problem in my life has come because I've failed to obey him. And I've tried instead to do it my way. And my way always leads in destruction, in disappointment, in a total mess. 
but not God's way. Maybe you're a procrastinator this morning. Or maybe this morning you're given to presumption. You just can't wait on God. Can't trust him enough to come through that you have to put a hand to it. When God has simply said, hands off, this is my business. I'm well able to take care of you. I made the heavens and the earth in case you didn't notice. The whole of the universe is kept by the power of my hand. What is your little problem that I can't fix? Just wait on me. I'll make it clear. I'll let you know. There'll be no ambiguity about it. When I speak, you'll know it. But in the absence of a commandment to move, stay put. Maybe that's the word to your heart this morning. And God is saying you need faith and obedience just to trust him where you're at. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I've resolved to go on with God at whatever cost. 2023 has passed. 2024 lies ahead. And I want to yield to God my ready obedience. If God says wait, then Lord, I'll wait. Lord, if you say move, then I move. In my own personal life, as a shepherd of this flock, and that's why one of the qualifications in 1 Peter chapter 3 is that an elder can't be self-willed. If I want to be self-willed in my own life and mess it up, that's up to me. But be self-willed and take a congregation off the cliff with me, it's unsinkable. God is speaking to our hearts. At the commandments of the Lord, they rested in the tents. And at the commandments of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Amen. Well, Father, I thank you this morning for your gracious help upon the preaching of your word in bringing home to heart and mind your heart this morning, your will this morning, your mind this morning. And some would think, Father, it's a little strict, and some would say it's a little narrow. But our Lord said, straight is the gate and narrow is the path that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find it. And Father, help us this morning to throw away our excuses and yield to you our glad obedience. Lord, let us not mock you this morning. Lord, you are a good and gracious God and you're not going to ruin our lives if we would but trust you, Lord. Give us grace this morning to trust you. We've seen your countenance. We've seen your glory. We've seen your character. Lord, forgive us this morning if we delay. Forgive us, Lord, if we've moved forward. But, Father, whether we've moved prematurely or whether we be found in the place of procrastination, we want to say this morning, Lord, we're coming back. We're turning back and we're heading back to camp. Oh, Lord, the camp has gone on ahead of us and we're moving forward. Oh, have mercy this morning, please. Upon each one of us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.